Jake's fancy accent here. Uh, hi, I'm Josh Gondelman. I'm a comedy writer and producer. Uh, I, uh, I, it says actor on my website. Irrelevant to this, honestly, irrelevant to my website. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a stand-up comedian. I started a TV, I did a teensy bit, I'll give you a quick rundown in two sentences. I did a teensy bit, two days of work on Billy on the Street, which is delightful. Then, for a long time, worked at Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, for about five years, was a staff writer before. Yep, going for that. I love them, them all. And then I left to be a writer and producer at Jesus and Mero for um, incredibly surprising claps, but I love them and I'll take them. And then, They're biggest fans over there. Hell yeah. I miss, I miss it. And then, um, and then did a little bit of consulting work for the final season of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So that's the last Ooh, 10 years of my life. Yeah. There you go. That's a, that's a good 10 years. Yeah, that's a pretty decent 10 It's years. a quality 10 years, and you have to have the decade. Oh, and then last year, professionally, I mostly walked in circles and yelled at buildings. That was uh, five months <laughs> as, last year. As one does. Mm -hmm. uh, and although I will be moderator and will not be uh, talking too much about my own experience, I do have experience working on uh, Love, Death, and Robots, the animated series from Netflix, which I have written uh, three scripts and two of my stories were that. Animation doesn't count. No, animation is so <laughs> Wow! Oh, is the worst. No, no, this is, he's going to be like this on this panel and on the panel he's on later today just because he's a shit. So, just as long as you know that that's right. Jock, on the other hand, is a perfect angel. Thank you. Yes. All right, so I'm not talented enough to behave otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first, very simple, basic question. Uh, tell the story of how you found yourself uh, getting into the writer's room in the first place and writing for television. How did you start? Uh, so I wrote these books, and then uh, somebody called and said, hey, we want to make them into a TV show, and I said, okay. And then when they started doing it, I said, hey, I want to write a script. And they were like, okay. I mean, they didn't know any better. Um, so they're like, sure, write a script for us. So the first season, um, we were like producers in name only. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we wrote a script, and the uh, head of the studio came down and said, hey, you know, for newbies, you guys actually know how to do this. <laughs> and, and we were like, cool, can we do more? And she was like, sure, you can do more. So by season two, we were real producers, and then by season three or four, we were EPs and yeah. Uh, I was functioning basically as the number two in, on the show. Right. And that's, so we sort of worked our ways up through the ranks. Yeah. You did have an in. Yes. Yes. Had an in because I wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you knew a guy and you were the guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Josh. Um, yeah, so I started doing stand up. I was a fiction major, short fiction major at Brandeis. Then uh, I graduated immediately, stopped writing fiction for. Uh, reasons more psychological than anything else. Um, I was doing stand-up starting in 2004, in the, mostly in the Boston area, then greater New England area, then on the road a bunch, and I kind of felt like I'd hit the wall in terms of what I was going to achieve in comedy for a while at least if I stayed in Boston. So I moved to New York thinking like, okay, it's kind of a tough road to hoe being a road comic with no credits, and I was 26 at the time, and I thought maybe there's something else out there. So I moved to New York, started doing more uh, writing for the internet, for magazines, with the intention of getting into TV. And I uh, ended up finding representation, who got me submitting to these late night shows, mostly. I did submission packet after submission packet with their the um, stuff they requested. Booked, again, booked a tiny bit of work for Billy on the Street and then got hired to do the social and digital writing for uh, John Oliver and then moved into the writer's room. I applied as a writer, they hired me for this other job, and then I ended up in the writer's room for season two and I stayed for, there for four years. Right. Well, that actually dovetails very nicely into, into the next question, which is both of you um, did have a writing experience elsewhere. I mean, obviously you're doing comedy, you were doing uh, novels, but you also, prior to that, were, were doing some game writing, which that's, I remind that that's correct. So let me ask you about that. Um, the type of writing that you did before, what about it uh, recommended uh, you as a, as a writer to the, to the TV writing, and then what were some of the disadvantages of that form when you were trying to adapt to television writing? So you start short. I think coming from stand-up into TV comedy writing is there's like a, a facility with jokes that is very helpful and then kind of an e 
egolessness of like having to have gone on stage and just eaten shit a million times. <laughs> and I think that really helps because when you get in the room and something eats shit, you know not to take it as personally because you've like truly had audiences full of people be like, no thanks. Um, so I think that is a really helpful skill that, that I came to uh, television with. But I also started kind of behind people who had previous closer to one-to-one -one TV work in that you just have to learn a new format, right? And you have to learn to write words that not only don't sound like, you know, I was writing scripts that had to not only not sound like a Josh Gondelman performance, but they specifically had to sound like a John Oliver performance. And so that is kind of a new thing, right? Mostly written as myself, right? First person essay writing, yeah. stand up. And then I had to learn how to write first person writing as a different guy who's much smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, so my, my experience is non-replicable, um, so it's not going to be useful to any of you. Uh, writing novels does not prepare you for writing screenplays at all. Uh, they're very different things, and, um, and in fact, most producers, if, if you write a book and it gets adapted, will not want you in the writer's room, they will not want you to write scripts. Um, we, our, our thing was super weird and very excellent. We were with a studio that had never made a television show before, so we took advantage of their <laughs> naivete and got in the writer's room that way. But uh, when we actually hired a showrunner, which was later in the process, we hired a, a very experienced showrunner to run the show, when the, when the studio head said, oh, by the way, the writers are going to be in the writer's room and they're writing a script the first season, his answer was, are you sure that's a good idea? Yeah. Uh, because usually it's not. Usually it's not a good idea. So. We were lucky, we snuck in through the back door while nobody was looking. Um, if you wind up writing a book or a story that gets adapted, uh, there may be a fair amount of resistance to you coming in and writing screenplays. And in fact, Daniel, who had written, my writing partner, Daniel, who had written many more books than I had, had a really hard time learning the screenplay format. Sure. Because he was so trained in the novel format, and there's such different ways of approaching story. Um, I, who had not written as many novels, quickly turned into a screenwriter, because sure. uh, I didn't know any better. Uh, but yeah, if you come in with a lot of novel writing experience, it can be a little difficult to make the transition. Right. Well, because what you are talking about, and let's kind of dive into that a little bit, is, is that um, everything, if you're doing, you, like you said, if you're doing stand-up, you're doing you. Yeah. Right? And if you are doing novels, it is a very specific format where you can have interiority uh, that you can't have uh, in screenwriting. And I think there's, there's something to be said about talking about making that transi transition from one writing form to another. Well, learning to write for a camera. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I mean, that's the first thing you have to learn when you're screenwriting is never put anything on the page that a camera can't see. Because the only thing that we have is the camera. And, uh, you know, so if you're a novel writer, you're constantly writing into your dialogue and, you know, people's feelings and that sort of stuff. If you put a feeling in a script, camera doesn't know what to do with that. Right. Uh, and, and it's also insulting to the actor, because the actor wants, <laughs> wants to decide for themselves what they feel in a scene. Uh, so getting rid of all of that and just thinking, in this moment, what will the camera see, and writing you know, what the ca only what the camera sees right. is tricky for a novelist. And I imagine writing for, for a page, right? If you wanted, you could write a uh, seven-page description of a meadow, and then on the on the page for a script, you go, it's a fucking meadow. It's a meadow. Yeah. And yeah. then people see it, because that's what the camera I, I, I jokingly tell people, like, I mean, this is not true. Writing screenplays is not easy. And it's not easier than writing books. But I joke that it's easier, because, like, exactly what you said. You know, if I'm writing a book, and, like, you know, they entered the warehouse, and then I have to spend a couple pages describing what the warehouse looked like. Uh, in screenwriting, go, interior, warehouse, day, yeah. done, I'm out. Um, and, then, and then somebody else's job is figuring out what a warehouse looks like, and they call those people like location uh, people and right. set designers and stuff. Right. Uh, it's not that easy, but I, I the the thing that I remember. So I used to be a journalist, <clears throat> and uh, when uh, Jurassic Park came out, um, I was uh, doing interviews, and Michael Crichton, uh, who had written the novel on which uh, Jurassic Park was. Uh, adapted, uh, it said, when you are writing a uh, screenplay, uh, or when you're writing a novel, you have like 100,000 words, you know, or it's 400 pages, he said. When you are writing a screenplay, um, if you were to put it into basically the same format, it would be 40 pages. 
Mm -hmm. So you lose automatically 90% of everything. Yeah. yeah. And so, so it is, like you're saying, it's not easier because you have to write with an economy that is not uh, demanded of novelists necessarily. Well, and screenwriting is a far more structured uh, writing style. Like, a novels can be very experimental. I mean, there are experimental screenplays, but it, especially in TV where I have mostly worked, um, there's a there's a very sort of rigid structure to TV, and uh, you know they, they, you need to quickly learn that structure and replicate it with each screenplay that you write. Right. Uh, whereas with novels, you can kind of I mean you can be Philip K. Dick, you just kind of do whatever you want. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, well, yes, I do that every day. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit more about what you said about um, writing for. John Oliver, yeah. or writing for someone else. Uh, how do you go from being in your own head and writing the stuff that is about you yeah. to writing for a very specific person who has a very specific tone and pattern and delivery? How do you get from one to the other? Yeah, the specificity of tone and pattern and delivery is actually like a gift as a writer because there are, you can see the form that the writing will probably take, right? And you can expand it in this direction or that direction, but you know, like, this is how the show generally goes. These are the kinds of jokes John likes to tell. These are the kind of things he doesn't like to do. And, and you can kind of tug in a direction if you're like, oh, I think this would be a fun addition to that palette. Sure. But it's, it's really helpful. I think it would be much harder. And I, I, you know, I've heard stories of being a little bit more difficult to go from zero with a host who doesn't necessarily have as defined a comedic voice, because then you really need someone, a writer, producer, or a team of people working with the host to go, here's what we think your perspective is, yes. or should be. And so like with John and with Jesus and Mero, it was like a very, a real gift to know like, oh, this is what these people are like on stage, and this, or, you know, on camera, and this is the kind of stuff that is natural to them or practiced for them. Right. So that's, yeah, that, it's really fortunate. I feel very lucky to have worked with, uh, for people with such defined voices and styles. Yeah. Is it though frustrating because there might be a joke where you're like, this would be perfect if only John Oliver were me? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> if only he had a different accent, which I call repressed Bostonian, um, <laughs> this joke would sound natural for him. For sure. And, and I think that is, but there are, the joy of it is there's stuff that I would make, that I could write for him, that I would, uh, you know, pitch for him to say that I would never say, right. that, that doesn't sound like me, or is just like, okay, man, if you want to go on TV and uh, and say this, that's your problem, not mine. And so <laughs> my personal, uh, like, project at Last Week Tim, because he's so sharp and heady and his accent makes him sound extra smart, uh, even when he's being regular smart, he, I, my, personal project was to write as dumb a joke as I could get onto the show. And I think that my best example was a joke with a punch on where he's doing an impression of like a talking dog from a commercial and he went, suck my dog dick. And I was like, that's, that's about as dumb as it gets. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna get back to you because I have another question about the, the writing of the talk to humor. Sure. But before I do that, I did want to follow up on you because we, we talked about the novel writing and making the translation from one or to the other and what things. But you did do game writing. Is there any relation between how you were doing game writing um, and anything that transferred over into uh, screenplays? Because I have this general theory yeah. that everything is useful in some way. Or oh, other. everything is useful. Everything you do will be, it will teach you things that are going to be useful later. You just often don't know how yeah. until afterwards. But uh, So the kind of game writing I was doing was not uh, at least initially. Because, so like if you're writing scripts for games, yeah, that's like writing a script. Like, sure. If you're writing sure. dialogue scenes for characters talking to each other, that I think would be very transferable. I didn't do that. I was doing sort of more like world building consulting. Right. Which is less useful. It's actually more like novel writing. Yeah. Uh, because you're because you're doing like the big, this is how the world came to be and here's why the gods are fighting with each other kind of stuff. Um, with with I think if you're writing, like if you're a writer on Baldur's Gate 3 and you're writing character interactions, I think that would transfer. I think that would be very useful. Right. So you don't think you don't think world building was useful in a in a sort of concrete sense for what you were doing with the expanse, or at least it didn't come through. Well, not, by, by the time the TV show happened, we already had four novels out, so the sure. world building was done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were just figuring out how to translate. But I think if you were starting from scratch. I mean, if you were starting a show that was not an adaptation of something else, yeah. 
Obviously, you need to understand how the world works. Uh, but I'll, I, I, I find that most TV writers play that a little fast and loose. Mm, yeah. Sort of like, we'll figure it out. Well, you know, by, and, and you can tell, <laughs> lost. Um, you can tell that like, they don't really know what's going on and they're sort of figuring it out later. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, a lot of times it's, it's we need to get the first season in the can, exactly. and That's then exactly we will right. figure out where we're going. Back exactly. Back. I, I have a follow-up question. Did you find there? Uh, sorry to. No, 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 no. Um, I, the, I, I'm the captain now. Yeah. Uh, um, did you find that there were like joys and or frustrations with like bringing your own work from one medium to another, like stuff that you're like, ooh, it, it's so cool to see this on the screen, or oh, this just doesn't play in the way it does in, in the novels. In, in fact, this was one of my questions. So ah. if you were working for my purposes anyway. Yeah. Oh. Josh Gollum and you were my puppets. So, <laughs> oh, accepted. <laughs> so if, if you don't enjoy collaboration, uh, do not work in TV. Uh, uh, fortunately for me, so I, I mean, the original Expanse thing was just me, because I had written it to be a game thing. Uh, so when Daniel came along and said, hey, you should write this as a book and we'll write it together, already we had created collaboration. And right. So the novel version of the Expanse is not exactly what the game version would have been. So it's already an adaptation at that point. Right. So when it got into the writer's room and more people were at it, and now showrunner is there who has final say. And yeah. by the way, the showrunner does have final say, you do not. Um, it was it was just like it was we, instead of creating a collaboration, we just expanded the collaboration. Mm, right. And if you don't enjoy the collaboration process, you will not enjoy TV because everybody gets a voice. You know, when you especially once you've actually gone into production, and um, by season three, I was producing my own episodes, so I really had to learn that very quickly. You're sitting in the first uh, production meeting. You know, it takes four hours, every department head is sitting there, and each of them, you know, the prop guys are going, hey, this thing on page seven that you described this way, here's what we're going to build. Uh, you have to be okay with seeing it and having it not be what you imagined, yeah. but recognizing that it's awesome. Yeah. You're like, that's better than what I thought of. Yeah. Thank you for creating that. And really, if you can take joy in other people's creativity, then yeah. you will enjoy the process. Yeah. If you want everything to look exactly the way you imagined it, you will be miserable. That's such a beautiful experience too, right? That moment of like, oh, I don't know exactly how this goes, but I'm going to trust the scenic design yeah. to like yeah. build this uh, this arena out. And you see it, and you're like, holy shit! I'm so glad that you were in charge of this and not me, because <laughs> <laughs> it would yeah. not have been this good. We have been asked. So uh, we had uh, Joanne Hansen was our costume designer all for all six seasons, and she's amazing. People would go, do the costumes look the way you imagine? I'm like, no. Because I'm not a costume designer, hers looked way, way better. Right, right. And everything she did is better than anything I've done. Yeah. yeah. I had something very similar with that happening with the Left, Death, and Robot. So they did my Three Robots episode, right? And when I wrote the, the, when I wrote it down for a short story, it was literally three robots sitting at a table, like the YouTube, you know, kids discover rotary phones, and the kids are like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Right? Um, and they couldn't do that because obviously they wanted to expand it out a little bit more. And the expansion that they did and the bodies that they created for the, the robots and everything was, uh, was again, so much more than I, I would have done because I was trying to just edit it out so this editor would stop bugging me doing like, where's my story, yep. where's my story, where's my story. <laughs> um, I want to talk, because you, you broached uh, collaboration, which I think is actually an extremely important uh, point to be making. Uh, because as, no as a novelist, I write it and then it goes off. But when you op open it up for TV, uh, it starts to be collaboration. Now, your collaboration was with this writer's room of like finding the right jokes. Mm -hmm. so, but not only so, in, in that particular case, not only is it collaboration, but in some ways, it's almost like a competition, is it not? Or is that not the right way of thinking of it? I, I don't think, I think if you come in thinking about, or if you're cultivating a writer's room to feel like a competition, I think you're setting people up for kind of a miserable day to day, right? Like, we, we know people didn't get into comedy writing to be gladiators. Um, and, and I think it's like much healthier to be like, let's together get to the best place. And I, and I think that holds, right? Like, obviously you want people kind of trying to refine each other's ideas, but I think when you feel like I'm trying to be better than this other person or get more jokes in than this other person, uh, I think it's like really hell. Uh, and I think there are shows that um, cultivate an atmosphere that's much more like, okay, you're, you're at risk if this week doesn't go well for you. And I don't think people do their best creative work 
with not, not just their backs against the wall in terms of like deadline and you have to make choices, but uh, like if, if, you, if you're not funny enough, you don't have a job anymore. And, and so certain places, uh, legendarily, Ellen, um, have uh, that reputation. I think people had a really hard time. I had heard that, I mean, and obviously I've never written on a comedy show, but I had heard that comedy writing rooms could be rough. Yeah, it'd be unpleasant places to work. Jennifer Hutchinson, who was on who was on the ship last year, yes. said in a in a talk that she gave that like drama writers' rooms, you're doing like hard, intense storytelling stuff sometimes, yeah. but it's like often a joy. In comedy writers, you're writing the silliest things you can imagine, and it's a nightmare. Yeah. And I don't think it has to be that way, but sometimes it is like it is a. Uh, psychologically bizarre experience to be in a windowless room on a Saturday being like how do I write another joke about Donald Trump that goes on the air tomorrow that doesn't sound like the 600 jokes about him we've done on this show already right. and the 500 jokes that every other show has already done about him this week okay so that's great because that was the question that I wanted to get back to you about which was talking about topicality yeah. and humor uh, that and specifically uh, on things that aren't necessarily in themselves particularly funny. The slide into fascism is not a, a, an inherently chuckle fest, right? Uh, I watched Jojo Rabbit, that was very fun. <laughs> yeah, when you have a 70 year remove, we can all have a good laugh. When it is, you know, uh, you know, uh, a whole bunch of people screaming, don't say gay, and a bunch of vulnerable teens, it's yeah. less, less funny. So here's the question for you. How do you do, because also especially, I'm sorry, uh, especially because uh, the state of the world that we are in now is that John Oliver or, uh, you know, the, uh, or the Daily Show is often more accurate and more engaged in the truth uh, of what's going on uh, than uh, some of the news networks. Uh, and so the question is how do you balance that topicality uh, and the humor, uh, and dealing with the fact that sometimes you're cracking jokes about things that are not funny at all. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a, a great multifaceted question. Um, and, and I and I honestly I have the answer. No, uh, it's it's really it's a difficult challenge. And I think like figuring out the angle in is always the challenge or the story that doesn't feel funny. Figuring out where the hypocrisy is or where the uh, kind of cartoonish villainousness is mm -hmm. that you can start like poking at that instead of just looking right into the teeth of the horrors of the world. Although at last week tonight they really looked into the teeth of the horrors of the world. They still do, and yeah. it's, it, so I think really peeling back like what is the thing that we can poke fun at here while still telling the story as accurately as possible and then still making it as funny as we can is always like a really interesting challenge. And with Jesus and Mero, the, the, it was kind of a, a fully different approach where they just like went kind of straight from the heart. So like John, um, everything was very based in research, right? And if the yeah. research didn't support it, even if it was a great joke, we have, we'd have to write another joke uh, that the research did point to. And with Jesus and Mero, they were so improvisational and so like didn't, truly did not, and I mean this as a, like a compliment, did not care about accuracy if the, if the emotional <laughs> truth of it was there. So it was like a very different experience where we, would, we could just do stuff that was like, this feels right and it is cathartic to say, even if it's not as accurate. So I think like it's a very different experience, but like really finding where the heart of a story is or like what the kernel of it is that you can start like, oh, this is something, a thread we can pull at that's not just like, uh, death, devastation, civil liberties being infringed on. Right. There was a stretch there where it felt like John Stewart was the only real news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, that was that's the absolute truth. And I will say, also, all that stuff, right, is based on the work of existing journalism that's out there, right? All the footage is co yeah. coming from existing journalism. And then there are there's a research staff on at, at all the shows. The last week tonight one is especially broad and ro large and robust and and. Really, they're really talented and wonderful, but like it is, so there is, you have those shoulders to stand on too, where like you're working together to like lay that foundation so that it feels real, and then the jokes are the next layer on top of that. Ty, I don't think that you would say that The Expanse is topical in the sense of, you know, it takes place in the future and so on and so forth, but there are a lot of themes to the show. 
uh, that have application today? Were you cognizant of those while you were writing uh, writing them, and whether or not how much of them should that people should be looking at and being like, oh, I see how that works in the real with relation to the world. I mean, I mean there, there's an oft repeated thing in sci-fi writing that every science fiction novel is written about the time it was written in, yes. no matter no matter how far in the future it's supposedly set. Right. Um, and, and you can't help but, I mean, even if you're not trying to write stuff that's topical, those are the things that are in your subconscious, you're going to write about them. So, I mean, we're writing about, like, uh, information control, you know, and, and we wrote about information control. Like, everybody was like, oh, you wrote Leviathan Wakes because the glitching had just happened, and it was about this guy running around sharing every piece of information he finds yeah. and causing chaos. And we had written it a year before that, but sure. obviously that was in the zeitgeist, right? right. Um, and, and so, like, you know, I mean, The Expanse ultimately is about racism and, and inequal access to resources. That's what it's about. Sure. And, uh, you know, and how when people see that they are not part of what they view as the future, they are easy to radicalize. Yes. And um, that is sort of the overriding theme of the whole thing. And so, you know, you, you're watching and you're like, oh, well, it was written about 9-11. It wasn't. 9-11 yeah. was a result of the same things we're writing about. Right. Because when people see the future, you go, oh, I'm not in that future, so I might as well do something insane because I'm not in the future. Right. Um, they're easy to ratify. Right. And so those themes are all over the place. And it's definitely written about the time we're in. The thing that you get away with in sci-fi is so we, are talking about racism, but we're not talking about racism with any of the existing racial divides that exist today, and that lets us do it. So like, we're in, so like, Belters hate Martians. We don't have Belters and Martians, so we can talk about that, and we're not stealing from any person's lived experience. We're not robbing somebody's lived pain to create drama, which is very tricky. You gotta be very careful. Yeah. Sci-fi lets you get away with that stuff. No. Um, so to, to bring back to like the day-to-day uh, -day aspect of being in a red room writing for TV. Um, here, here's a question that really I started thinking about, because uh, I know quite a lot of people who work in writers' rooms and who work for TV, which is, is it a healthy environment for creativity? You were talking a little bit about that, you know, with, with if you make a competition, but there are also the things like, there are always deadlines. There are always notes from studios and networks, and sometimes those notes make absolutely no sense whatsoever, like speaking from experience. And then whenever anything is out, there is always instant uh, uh, commentary and criticism from fans, uh, from you know critics, uh, and from flat out haters. You know, and is that uh, is this something that um, ultimately can can wear you down? Can you get the burnout, or is it something that uh, uh, goes in the other direction? <laughs> I'm I'm looking at you both. Um, you just happen to be looking at me. Okay. <laughs> he was looking at you, so. Um, uh, so I don't read reviews, and I think reading your own reviews is a terrible idea. Because uh, the, the good ones will mess you up just as much as the bad ones will. Uh, the good ones will give you a false view of your own project just as much as the bad review will, so avoid reviews. But 100% uh, the answer to that question is who's your showrunner? Right. Because the showrunner is ultimately the boss, and they have enormous power. The, the only studio remedy for a showrunner they disagree with is to fire them. And it's incredibly expensive to fire a showrunner. Right. So the showrunner has enormous power. Um, and which is why when you read about the horrible shows that everybody hated, it was because they had a bad showrunner and he was abusive. They were abusive to their staff. I mean, he isn't. <laughs> he, an yeah, no, he's yeah. usually a uh, But, but there's, because the showrunner is the boss, if, if the showrunner encourages creativity in their staff, if the showrunner encourages you to bring your craziest ideas and then doesn't make fun of them in front of the group, mm -hmm. you, you feel a freedom to yeah. be very creative. Um, and they're also the barrier between you and the studio. So when the studio comes out, we have a note, and you're like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever read in my life. This, the showrunner can sit there and go, we're not doing that, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. I, so our showrunner, Narain Shankar, I give him credit, uh, he, would, he, would, he would say, we will read every note fairly mm -hmm. and yeah. give it an opportunity just something. Right. So he would read the note and he would say, is there anything in this note? Is Their solution is stupid, so we're not going to do that. But is there a problem that this note is revealing that we didn't see? Right. And, and because of that, you wind up with this very sort of balanced view of everything because the showrunner is leading you to this balanced view of everything. I think I would not enjoy working for some other showrunners that I've met. Sure. Read sure. 
uh, where it's much more sort of uh, Darwinian. Yeah. Uh, but Noreen was never like. It. Yeah. 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 I, I think that is such a great point. It's about the institution, right? Like when I worked at um, Mrs. Maisel, there kind of wasn't a, too much of a budgetary lid. Like the, the the ceiling was much higher on what you could accomplish within that budget because they were working with, they were one of the first shows in Amazon, it was a big flagship show, yeah. and, and so you could really pitch kind of elaborate production numbers, and, and that was really uh, thrilling to be a part of, coming from a late night show on Showtime that didn't have a real history of late night shows, so they were, you know, they were, you go, okay, we, we, we have a classroom of 20 kids for this sketch, and they go, could you make it four? <laughs> and you go, okay, but in that sense, it also did kind of spur creativity through restriction, right? You go yeah. like, what can we do with the tools we have at our uh, at our uh, disposal? So it, 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 there are lots of different ways for creating creative environments, but I think the healthiest ones, it is really like the people you're working with and how much they're trying to help you realize a vision versus how much those people are gonna say like, no, can't do it, won't do it. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, you brought up something incredibly important. Um, you have a budget. So everything is everything is driven by how much money you can spend, and that's an excellent point. Like and so, uh, uh, George R. R. Martin talks about when he first got into TV because he had come out of novel writing and he went to work for uh, the '80s reboot of Twilight Zone. Yeah, and he was his first ever job in screenwriting was he was adapting his friend Roger Zelazny's book or uh, short story, um, Last Defender of Camelot. Right, and he, did, he rewrote it as a screenplay. And he said it was incredibly frustrating as an operator because he would come up with a script It's like hundreds of knights are battling in a field and they go, could it be two guys fist fighting? <laughs> because we don't have money for armor and we don't have, you know, and so everything, you know, you come in with your script and you're like, it's a giant castle and they're like, or it's a room. <laughs> and so being aware of the budget. Yeah. And how that is going to drive your creativity is extremely important. I'm glad you brought that Yeah, up. and that's something too, I think, the more you work in producer roles, right, where yeah. you have to consider like how long your day is and who oh, and yeah. people are on set. I love it when they segue into a question that I have without <laughs> prompting. <laughs> this is when you tipped backstage. Yeah. So exactly. I think we could get seamless with it. Yeah. But that is it is a different thing where like once you have that producer voice in your head more naturally, yep. then that is something you consider. Where I do think there is kind of a beauty to just being like a dumb, oblivious writer, where you're just like, uh, they're standing on the wing of a spaceship, uh, fighting with lasers, and then uh, one million bees descend upon them. And then, yeah, and then the producer goes, where are we going to get a million bees, idiot? Yeah. CGI? And like, no! <laughs> yeah, or, or, or even just, you know, talking about writing screenplays and learning that format. When, when you're on set and you're a senior producer, which by the, the third season, we were senior producers on the show, and budget becomes part of your job, right. when you're like, I have to shoot eight and a half pages a day. Right. So these eight and a half pages have to be producible, or we're behind and we just never get to shoot some scenes. Right. And so suddenly you start viewing screenplays that way. You're reading scripts that other people wrote, and you're like, this is not producible. I cannot make eight and a half pages of this in one day. Right. Yeah. I, I, I have to I, I have to admit, I, I, got a, I got a screenplay of an adaptation of, of, of a work of mine just very recently, and I was reading it, and it's perfectly good. But the one thing I noted noted was one character kept singing 80s songs. Yeah. And my brain was music clearances. Yeah. They're, that's so expensive. Why does he yeah. want to blow the pilot my, uh, pilot money on music clearances? Yeah. You sing one Metallica song, and that's your entire budget. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. It's not funny. All right. We're gonna. So that's how you end up with. Come on in, Sam guy. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Gellman here all week. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So be thinking of your questions. There's microphones here and here. Go ahead and start coming down if you have some questions specifically. Remember, one part questions in the form of a question, and then as short as possible, so we can get to as many questions as possible. Um, this is another one of those big open-ended questions, which is, it's a tumultuous time in film and television right now. You just finished a, a strike, which you won, by the way. Well, oh, we kicked ass. <laughs> Thank you, WGA. Yeah. Shout yeah. 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 out to SAG after it as well. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. absolutely. Uh, so there was the, the month long red strike last year. Uh, TV and streaming right now are in a phase of contraction after many years where they're just like, here's money, go. They're yeah, no more 40 million in episode shows. No, 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 that's all in the past right now. 
Um, and overhyped or not, and we can get into that a little bit, the specter of, of AI and large language models. Uh, because you know, if you say to not these two producers, but to a producer, oh, you don't have to actually have a human to make words. They're going to be brutally bored. Oh, you're talking about the dumb producers. Oh yeah, that's 100. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, this is where we are in film TV right now. Um, what is your take for the short and medium term, or even long term, for uh, writers, writers' rooms, and uh, where you go from here? I mean, are you optimistic? I, I'm very optimistic. Uh, so the great thing about the contraction is uh, me and my business partners, who uh, made the expanse. Um, we got a reputation for being able to deliver a quality show for a very limited budget. Yeah. So we're who everybody's looking for right now. We're, they're like, we, you know, we can't go crazy with, with the budget. We're like, gotcha. We know how to do that. <laughs> when they find out what the budget of The Expanse was, they're always like, you made it for that? We're like, yes. And we can make your show for that, too. Right. So uh, that was really good for us. The people who could only make shows for a 50 million an episode, those people are having a hard time paying a job right now. Sure. On the AI side, I think if you have your show written by AI, it's a terrible, stupid show. Mm -hmm. uh, because my description of AI is if you ask AI for a sandwich, it takes 10,000 sandwiches, it puts them in a blender, it blends them all together, then it creates a sandwich-shaped mold and it injects the slurry from the blender into that mold. So what you get is shaped like a sandwich, and it contains things that sandwiches contain. But it is the worst fucking sandwich you've ever eaten in your life. <laughs> so, so I'm not that worried about it. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say I'm pessimistic in the short term, optimistic in the long term, which that's just kind of a, a global, my global note on life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think in the short term, this contraction is a real problem. And I think for them, to, for the studios to try to, for the people with the money to try to blame it on the strikes, which is people asking for fair compensation yeah. for work performed, it is disingenuous, right? What they were doing was throwing around money that they didn't have. Uh, and it a business model that never proved it worked, and that destroyed an existing, fairly functional, flawed, in need of tweaks, but fairly functional business model. And yeah. they, they blew it up on their own because they thought there was some secret, uh, infinite supply of cash on the other side of it. So that is, that makes me feel pessimistic, the, the, the executive structure. I think, like Ty said, I think that people want good work, they want well-crafted stories, they want production value that shows that, like, Human beings put care and time and effort into things. I think that, um, so that is my optimism in the long term. I think eventually we, we will course correct, right, and go like, okay, we can't just throw infinite money into a pit. That's not how, money in a pit doesn't perform. Um, but we also can't be making the cheapest things imaginable and underestimating the intelligence of our audience and their appetite for things that are um, rich and textured and, and come from, diverse voices and represent all different kinds of stories. So I think like, in the long term, I think it'll correct, but I think it's gonna be a rocky year or two. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get with questions, and it looks like we have our first question over here. Uh, yeah, this one's for Josh. Do you have uh, an example of a scene or a storyline for Mrs. Maisel that, you, that was epic that they just said yes to? Oh gosh, nothing that I pitched, because I came in, so the question, oh, you, everywhere, you're a microphone. <laughs> um, okay. Um, okay. Your heart uh, was in the right place. Yes, 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 yes. I was doing the rephrase thing for the audience that already heard the question. Um, but there was like a, there was a scene where where Midge in the season I wrote on, where she's doing a corporate event on a cruise, and she gets thrown <laughs> off the boat, or she throws a guy's jacket off the boat, and it's just like this beautiful, like it's just so beautifully produced. They have all period cars and clothes, and so just, and I just come from the late night world where you're like, okay, they're wearing. Uh, Vintage um, Ralph Lauren, and they go, No, we're wearing uh, Polo Grounds Limited that we got at Marshall's. And so <laughs> it, it was so nice to be able to just like think a thing, and, and they'll go, Yeah, we'll make it happen. Yeah. But that's the one that comes to mind immediately. There was also, I'm so sorry, yeah, they yeah. also, after the final table read, which is like a very beautiful, emotional thing to have happen, they had a small but noticeable fireworks display in celebration above the East River in New York. Our offices were in Brooklyn. And then the next morning on the news, like on New York One, they, there was like a little story that was like, what the hell was up with all those fireworks last night? <laughs> <laughs> like, we called the police. They had no idea there would be fireworks last night. So that to me was like the, the, the funniest budgetary expense I witnessed. Uh, there was a question over here. Yes. 
Uh, can you describe the writer's room, especially when the guys have gotten behind on your schedule? What, what is the writer's room experience like? Who, who, who are you asking both of us? Uh, how about you, Josh? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, because I worked on shows that were under pressure to produce work very quickly, you could never get that far behind. But when you were a little behind, it did get a little kind of stressful as you got to that point. But then ultimately, I mean, I think it's like an SNL maxim of like, the show doesn't go on because it's ready, the show goes on because it's 11.30. So like eventually, <laughs> you, get the, you get the joke as right as you can get it, you get the cut as blocked as you can get it because it has to go on the air tonight. And so there is a little frenzy, but you, I, I don't think we ever, I was ever on a show where we were like, well, this bites, <laughs> but we still have to put on TV. Yeah. But yeah, it does get stressful as you get down to the wire. Yeah. Oh, we don't have nearly the time pressure that a live show has. Uh, but you, you can get behind, especially if, uh, especially if the writers who have been assigned to write scripts are not delivered producible scripts. Um, and, and that is one thing. It, once you reach the senior level, once you're a senior producer on a show and you suddenly become a rewriter of other people's scripts, um, that's where you get a lot of I, I literally was handed, um, this was in a mid-show, mid um, the showrunner came in, we shared an office, and he came in, he handed me a script and an outline, and he said, this script is unproducible, it's terrible, make it look like that outline. And I had two days to do it. And it was a 48 page script. So I rewrote a script in 40, uh, 48 pages in two days, and the highest compliment I've ever received is I gave it to the showrunner, he read it, sitting in the office, he read it, he handed it back, he said, all right, go prep it. And uh, that was that was cool. Yeah. All right, question over here. Question for Josh. When uh, John Stewart recently returned to the air, yeah. um, I listened to a lot of the New York Times podcasts that sort of pretentiously said he was really a journalist, even though he was masquerading as a comedian. Yeah. And he was a but as Ty pointed out, um, the the actual use of facts and and, and truth to to what was going on in the world was he was still a major conduit. So I was wondering if you could talk about sort of in the writer's room for your show, uh, what it was like to to balance like comedy versus you maybe feeling somewhat like a journalist, like all the fact checkers aside, like what was that? Like? Yeah, I think we wanted to get it as right as we could. That was what our, our intention was as writers, was always to get the story as right as we could, but because it was a room full of comedy writers, some of whom had backgrounds in journalism, others of whom did not, I think we really wanted to make it funny. And so I think that that was, that drive is really important because otherwise, like, we would, if, you know, if there weren't the jokes, I think people, sometimes people say like, oh, it's like the news, and you go, well, I don't know if you've ever watched the news, but there aren't like breaks for laughter most of the time. <laughs> and so we, it, it felt, we always tried to get it right, but I think in the writer's room, our kind of secret mission was like, we're getting as many jokes in the script as as John and Tim, our bosses, will keep. Because that's what I think made the show, it makes the show, I say made in the past tense because I left, but uh, object permanence exists. <laughs> so, Tom Broca, not funny. <laughs> not funny. <laughs> not funny. Not funny. Not funny. Um, and, and so I think that that was the mission, was like we were trying to get as many jokes in as possible, but without uh, destroying the structural integrity of the stories. Okay. Sorry, Ty, this is another question. No, no, no he's, he, he's funnier than me. <laughs> um, I'm really curious about the structure of how, um, in, a, in a show like, uh, uh, John, uh, not John, sorry. This one? Yeah, um, what you've worked on, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that uh, how the, the research comes to the writer's room, does yeah. it come like in the form of like an outline of a story? and then you put that into a story, sure. or how does that exactly work? So when I was there, the process was, there would be like a week frothing process of research and footage. There's a team that did research, a team that, that worked with footage and, and culling and finding it. Then they would, then the writers were brought in to kind of look at this vast collated uh, set of documents. The research document, the research memo was usually about 60 pages. The footage transcripts were like, two to 500 pages uh, wow. with attended video. Uh, and then the writers start working on an outline, and then there would, there would be meetings bouncing that stuff back and forth. So you create an outline that John and Tim and, and the writers and the researchers all let this tells the story. Then the writers would go off, two writers usually, sometimes three, sometimes one would go off, these are for the long stories, would go off writing a script, and they would have a couple days to turn that outline into a script. And then there would be 
rewrites, John and Tim would kind of rewrite it so it sounded the way they wanted and told the story they wanted, and then the writers would be uh, locked in a windowless room as they were like, another joke, another joke, another joke. Uh, and then I think by the time our psyches were completely unhinged, it was Sunday night and we got to go home. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we're going to, uh, let's cap on the questions here um, because we're going to rapidly run out of time and let's make these as quick as we can with both questions and the answers. Sorry. No, 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 you're great. <laughs> All right. So, um, this regarding screenwriting, so whoever wants to answer, yes, is when you were starting out screenwriting, um, what was, since it is a very structured, structured way of writing, what were the, what was the thing that hit you in the face, like, okay, you've watched TV forever, or, you know, see movies forever, what was the thing that hit you in the face of, oh yeah, I guess that's been staring me in the face all the time, and I had no idea that that was actually part of the structure of how to write a screenplay? Uh, well, I mean, for a long time, because of commercials, all TV was buybacks, buyback structure. Um, learning to write in the five act structure uh, when I was still on commercial TV, uh, you know, where you're like, oh, I get it, you're writing to the commercial break. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is the one I already mentioned, writing for the camera. Uh, that that nothing belongs in a screenplay that a camera can't see, which you never think about until you're actually writing screenplays, and you're like, oh yeah, I can't, I can't say she felt sad. That camera doesn't know that. Um, so you just have to make the dialogue sad, and the actor picks up on it, and then they look sad when they're saying it. Oh, and the last thing is, how much of the heavy lifting emotionally is done by the soundtrack? Um, that you don't have to write emotion into the scene because the showrunner will pick a soundtrack that tells you that. Yeah, that's the sad violence. Good next question. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm still really new at writing, and I was wondering, other than just solo practice, short stories, warm ups, is there anything that you recommend studying or learning from to improve prose or characterization or structure? Read no, it. you're already doing the thing. Yeah, and read your stuff out loud. Yeah, honestly, read it out loud because reading out loud will reveal, like, particularly with dialogue, <laughs> things that you are writing that no human would actually ever say. Which even after 30 years, I still do. I write dialogue with semicolons. What the fuck am I? Doing? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I talk with semicolons. <laughs> Um, I have one little thing to add, sure. is just read and watch the kind of stuff you want to be doing and really just sponge it up, right? Go like, oh, I'm noticing these little tricks that I can uh, soak up and apply in ways that are your own voice rather than the voice of... And if I could say one more thing to the baby writers, it's okay to suck. Yeah. You will suck. Yeah. The, in the first thousand pages of stuff you do will be terrible. That's okay. You're learning how to write. I mean, we, we fall down a lot when we learn how to walk. That doesn't mean we're bad at walking. You just needed some time. Um, so it's okay. When you read your stuff and go, oh, this is terrible, but I learned something, and then you write the next thing, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Quick, as quick Prime, as you can. Primarily for Ty, how much does doing the novel and TV stuff replace the creative pitch to your game? No, I still, I, I mean, I, I recently did a world building document for an incredibly popular game a couple years ago that I'm not allowed to talk about. Because I signed an NDA. Uh, no, I still do the stuff. Minesweeper. <laughs> yes, I wrote Minesweeper. All the world told me for Minesweeper. I just outed me. Damn it. And there's deep, deep, deep lore to Minesweeper. I hope you guys all caught it. Yeah. Final question over here. For Ty, you, you started the expanse with four books in there, and you know, of course they want to make as many, you want to make them into as many uh, series as the books that have gone forever. Um, so they're going to be like rewriting them and introducing bits of it that's going to pay off in the second season and you know asking for like well what should we be hinting at for books that haven't even come out yet how do you navigate that space in terms of the temporality of there could be as many books as your publisher will get but way, maybe less of the tv series because you know the, the studios are more expensive uh, I, well there's two parts to that we knew we were only going to do nine books we had already capped it at that so that was going to be the end no matter what uh, but on the TV side, you, you're always cognizant of they may cancel us after this season, so let's leave as few hanging threads as possible. But uh, you're also looking for natural breakpoints. We knew there was a natural breakpoint after book three, so if they canceled us after season three, that kind of felt okay. And we knew there was a natural break after book six, so if they canceled us after season six, that was okay. The worries you have is, God, I hope they don't cancel us after season four. Yeah. 
All right, so uh, thank you all for coming. I want you all to know that there will be two more writer panels today, one at uh, noon, that's on memoir, and then at one, uh, that will be on uh, science fiction. Ty will be on that one. I will be on both. Uh, please come and see the other panels so they don't feel sad and they miss you. Uh, and for uh, Ty and Josh, thank you so much for your fabulous, fabulous, fabulous answers to this, uh, uh, to the question. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Josh, for having